Education Update had a spectacular visit and interview with Liberty Science Center CEO Paul Hoffman, who has been at the helm for eight months. A prolific author, chess master, restaurateur, former editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Scientific American staffer, television interviewer, and paper game tricks expert, he is a summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Harvard University and is perfect as the leader of the Liberty Science Center. The center, in Jersey City, houses labs, modern equipment, hands-on science activities, and the nation's largest IMAX geodesic dome theater. With over 600,000 visitors a year, including many school groups, it has a major impact on STEM education for visiting students and schools, including students you are seeing now. One of the exhibits Hoffman is spearheading to open in April 2014 is the Rubik's Cube, the most popular mathematical game in the world. Founded 40 years ago by Professor Erno Rubik from Hungary and a personal friend of Hoffman, the exhibit will be sure to attract many thousands of people. According to Hoffman, one of the reasons for the popularity of the Rubik's Cube is that it brings reason to the world of chaos. Google is collaborating on the exhibit. So Paul, I have read a lot about you and you come across as truly a Renaissance man. I mean chess and, and the Rubik's Cube and uh, making uh, magic out of paper, and making paper do things that nobody else can do. Um, and you've written many books, of course. You're, you're a true intellectual and Renaissance man. How did you get to be that way? My father was an English professor. He was a professor of American literature. But our house was filled with books, on tons of books. You were tripping over them on the stairs on every subject. So a lot of it was through reading. And you know, as a kid, I was interested in everything. And I've been lucky enough to, uh, you know, basically I'm an amateur who knows a lot about a lot of different subjects, but obviously not as deep as anybody who's professionally involved in those. But I enjoy that. Enjoy that. I mean, my first job right out of college that I started the day after I graduated was at Scientific American, where um, in th that day the magazine was just written by scientists. But written in some cases included ghostwriting articles for them. So I just went off to people's labs. I worked with really great minds, Francis Crick, people like that. Um, and I learned more science by spending a month in someone's lab than I learned when I was at Harvard as an undergraduate. So I've always been interested in a lot of things, and I'm just lucky that I can carry that over. Fabulous, fabulous. So, so it was the books. So what do you think about Borders bookstores all closing? And are we really leaving the paper trail completely behind? We're going to enter technology and there are going to be no books? Said. No, I don't think we're leaving thinking. the paper trail completely behind. You know, it's, it is sad. It is sad. Um, but, you know, there's evidence now that more people are reading than before. I mean, it certainly is easy. If I'm sitting out in a restaurant with some bunch of other folks in, in, in Brooklyn, and I'll be there, and I'll be you know, having a drink at the bar, and someone will introduce themselves. I'll get in a conversation with a the person. They find out I'm a writer. And they order books. You can order books on the spot now. You, know, you may forget to go and get them now. So there's some evidence that, that uh, there's more reading. And you know, so we can denounce the trend, because you know, books are beautiful. I certainly think that. I've written 14 of them. I don't want paper books to go away. On the other hand, if these other platforms are opening more people up to it, I'm in favor of that. So you think the Nook and the Kindle are actually opening up? I think they are. Reading? I think they are. Just like, you know, movie making changed when we went to digital cameras. Okay, there are many uh, old timers that prefer film, film is better, all sorts of reasons. But going digital, I mean, it's opened it up and the cost of the equipment has, has fallen. When I mean, you have one videographer here doing this interview, and we don't have a team of 20 people doing the lighting and the sound and everything. So it's opened it up to, to it's kind of democratization of the movie making process. So yes, it's changed, but I would argue that we're better for it, so. You have uh, written um, and you've said that your work explores the relationship between genius madness, obsession, and creativity. And um, I would like to know, um, you know how you summarize the relationship between creativity and madness. What's interesting, an obsession. I mean, a lot of people that have done great things, you know, whether it's a great scientific discovery, whether it's composing an incredibly great piece of music, whether it's being a great pianist, you, know, you have to have devoted you know, countless hours to doing that. Sometimes that becomes at the price of other things in your life, okay? Uh, 
but I'm interested in you know what it takes to do great things and the obsession and genius that's required. Now sometimes, particularly in the sciences, when somebody comes up with a theory that's totally out of the box, but it turns out to be correct, okay? The mind is structured in such a way, they entertain lots of out of the box ideas, but not all of them correspond to reality. I mean, there are many instances of that. Um, so I think there is a relationship. I mean, people that are out of the box thinkers might also lead out of the box lifestyles. Sometimes it works for them, sometimes it doesn't. I don't mean to overgeneralize either, because there's many exceptions to, to all this, of course. But if you, if you have a, uh, a passion for something, follow it, would you say? A absolutely. And it's funny, because I've, you know, the chess world that I'm heavily involved in, that I've written about, I mean, some people say, well, you know, chess must make you crazy. Look at Bobby Fischer. I mean, he was crazy. Uh, the only other American world champion, a guy named Paul Morphy back at the time of the Civil War was also crazy. So we have two people that rose to the pinnacle of chess that were Americans that were nuts. You know, other folks would argue, well, that is the case. Maybe chess provided structure to their lives. Maybe these are people that might have been off the deep end uh, even more so, but uh, chess provided a kind of order and a kind of outlet for what they do. You have done many, many fascinating interviews. And I wondered which one you thought was the most interesting for you as the interviewer. Um, Maybe not one, just a few. You know. I mean, I interviewed James Watson, you know, Nobel laureate yes. for the structure of DNA. And one of the things he talked about was mental illness, because he's a son that suffers from mental illness. And he talked about it in a very passionate and, and sad kind of way about how we've sort of neglected a lot of the basic scientific research on mental illness that one of his last legacies that he would like to leave is being able to you know, raise enough money and put the laboratory work in effect so that we could search more for you know, genetic components of, of, of mental illness. Um, that, that was a very interesting... What year was that interview. approximately? Very recently, oh. uh, probably 2010, but 2011. I mean, pretty, either very early 2011 or late, late 2010. He's, yeah, he's still associated with it, yeah. So that was a very interesting interview that I've done. Um, I've mean, interviewed a lot of interesting people. Richard Dawkins, um, Penn Jillette, just thinking about Oliver that. Sacks. Oliver Sacks. Was he? Was he? Uh, yeah. I haven't interviewed Oliver Sacks. I've dealt with him quite okay. a bit. Um, I edited some articles that he wrote. Mm -hmm. um, we've both appeared on radio shows together. He was just here at Liberty Science Center. Mm -hmm. How can educators best teach kids? in their classrooms of any age about science and about STEM. What should they do? <laughs> Broad question. Uh, yeah, if only it were so easy. I mean, I think one thing is we really have to get away from this model of one size fits all, the model of which, you know, unfortunately, when I look at things that have changed since the founding fathers in America, education has changed the least. I mean, the foods we eat are totally different. And I remember as a kid, you went into a grocery store, you in a fancy store, you know, you went to the produce section, it was just iceberg lettuce. Now we go in, you know, there's right. castles, there's all these different choices. Everything has changed our society, right. and education has changed the least. You still have kids sitting in a square array of desks with someone mm -hmm. preaching at them from the front mm -hmm. of the room. We need to move away from that model. Kids learn at different speeds. Kids can't sit still at a young age, and they shouldn't be expected to. And programs that run with kids at di different levels and let them to explore. They need guidance. I mean, you know, you know, I don't believe in the concept of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a movement called free schools when I was a kid that my father was actually very involved in, and there wasn't enough guidance there. But I think I the balance that. between uh, letting kids explore and directed exploration is, is incredibly important. So letting them explore, letting them follow their curiosity, and giving them an opportunity to have hands-on uh, problem solving, which is what you do here in the Liberty Science Center. Absolutely. And you know, and not dismissing the kids that aren't getting it as fast as some of the others. People learn in all different ways. And the one-size-fits-all model that most schools are structured, you know, they don't accommodate the range of human behavior, the range of differences in learning, the range of differences in speeds of learning in different styles. And I think we need to respect the individual more, not just as adults, but as, as we, you know, respecting individual differences in children. 
I'm just going to go back to one point that you made about being surrounded by books, your father's books. Is there one book that sticks out in your mind as having made a seminal influence in your life? Well, you know, there were books that I read as a kid with contraptions in them, like Homer Price. Uh, we have a machine that makes donuts. Uh, <laughs> I was very interested in contraptions and, uh -huh. and imagination because, you know, I wasn't interested in. To I mean, I enjoyed it. You know, far out science fiction that created another world. I enjoyed, but I also knew it was too fantasy. Mm -hmm. Where I like things that more took place in the world we live in. But somebody is pushing the the envelope mm -hmm. either mm -hmm. by making some mm -hmm. weird invention that, right. Right. that 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 does something. So it was books like that that influenced me a lot as a right. kid. Even things like Encyclopedia Brown, you know, this whole series of this kid detective who who uh, charges for solving uh, mysteries on his block. Um, I was quite influenced by that. I set up a little detective agency when I was a kid and oh, wanted wow. to charge my neighbors for, you know, <laughs> solving Did anybody pay you anything? This. I think so. I didn't get a lot of business, but you know, <laughs> they were more like a, along the line of somebody misplaced something right. in their house and they had to come find it as opposed to theft. Talking about Encyclopedia Brown, you were the editor in chief of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I was. And it's no longer. Is it only digital now? Well, it's still going. They're still, you know, they announced that uh, they weren't going to print anymore, but they quickly had a rush of people that were buying it. I don't know. I don't work there anymore, yes, so I don't know the inside on it. it. But, it's, um, but it's, it goes strong in the digital world. Thank you so much for letting us come and uh, interview you today. This Thank was you. an absolute pleasure. And I can't wait to stick my hands into some experiment <laughs> and think outside the box here at the Liberty Science Center. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. That was great.